Welcome. This is Tuesday, the 13th of March, 2012. And this is Simply the Truth with me, Doug Harris. Thank you indeed for joining us because you are as important as those of us here in the studio. Indeed, without you, what would be the point of the program? So we're glad you're there and we hope that you will find this next hour or so uh, very interesting and enlightening and uh, maybe a little bit challenging as well. I mean, we've all got our Bibles and uh, I hope you can get your Bible, open it up and you'll see that there's the Bible. We read it, we believe it, it's there before us and we're told to obey it. But how did we get it? And please don't say you went down to the Christian bookshop and bought it. How did we get it? Well, to help me uh, unravel this subject is uh, Mr. Marmite himself. Love him or hate him, JT. Welcome, JT. Thank you, Doug. It's a privilege to be here again. Uh, it's wonderful to, uh, to have you with us. Um, and you've got the right tie on, haven't you, for the I job? Have, I have the right tie. This tie... Uh, if viewers can have a little look at it, they can have a guess what it is. It's in a particular language, and the language is Greek. And it is a, like a copy of the Codex Alexandrinus. And if they go to the British Library in London, they can actually see the, the original. Right. And this is um, a complete copy of the Bible from the 300s-ish right. AD. The complete copy of the Bible is not on your tie, it's, no, just, it's just part of it. Philippians chapter 2 is on my tie, really? <laughs> <laughs> which is the bit where it says you should have the same attitude as Christ Jesus, right. who being in the form of God. Right. Yeah. Well, great. So there we are. We've got a living, walking uh, <laughs> example before us. But I think it is important for us to understand how we got the Bible, because although it might challenge us a little bit as, as we go along, I think in the end, it will bring us down to a wonderful understanding mm. of why we can trust this word that, right. that we have. When I was a teenager, uh, obviously I'd come to faith in Jesus when I was about 12, which is very young, but um, I read a book, and it's this one here, oh, yes. uh, Books and the Parchments yes, by F.F. Bruce. F. F. Bruce. Yeah. And I don't think it's in print now, but you can still get copies. And this book preserved me from falling into all sorts of mistakes. It talks about how we got the Bible and much of what we're going to be doing today. And uh, um, you know, I did honestly have this thought that the Bible had dropped out of the sky yeah. or had been placed carefully on some kind of an altar and given to mankind. Uh, but it wasn't quite like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, let, let's begin to unravel it because, I mean, I, I think there is this feeling among some Christians that God almost dictated it yeah. to, to the various people and they wrote it down and it all sort of got stored together somewhere. Mm -hmm. But of course, we're actually dealing with thousands of years. We're dealing with scores of people mm -hmm. um, and, and most of them didn't know each other. That's right. Uh, the, the, there's a few simple facts people can remember. It was written by approximately 40 people over a period or compiled over a period of 1500 years on three different continents in three different languages mm. and as you say most of them didn't know each other and it is one of the miracles I think of history that the Bible hangs together so amazingly well but um, uh, it yes the Bible emerged yes. it was a very organic thing and of course when you read the Bible it's once it's now this is be careful when I say this there will be calls okay um, <laughs> it is a mistake to think that the Bible is just divine I'll pause there for pause, a moment pause there for the rotten eggs for yes. it to be quoted and thrown back at me um, it's equally wrong to think of the Bible as just human mm -hmm. because it is both so for instance you can read the Gospel of Mark and you can pick up Mark's, you know, or Peter's actually, because it's Peter's account, rushing type personality, enthusiastic, moving from next thing to the next thing. Uh, you can pick up uh, Paul's sort of tortuous, long sentences in many of the letters that he's written using his sharp mind. Um, if you're particularly clever, you can notice these, the literary quality in Hebrews or in Acts, mm. which is in marked contrast, say, to the Gospel of Mark, which isn't particularly literary at all. Um, so it, it is, it, 
it includes the personalities of the people but it's like if they are the ships if you like God is the wind that blows yes. them and and that is it because God did use the people and he used them with their personalities and that's why we get such such a distinction mm -hmm. obviously he used them with their personalities and 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 he used their sometimes they're idiosyncrasies uh, i mean so as you said you know in mark's gospel we get peter who was very much mm. his account i mean all his failings and uh, are there with him and, and we have it all the way through and yet god we can say inspired i mean that's a word that's used and it, it, explain how what that means in scripture that God inspired but man mm. wrote it down explain what that means the, there's, there's a verse in, in the Bible 2 Timothy 3 16 which says um, uh, all scriptures God breathed the word yes. in Greek is the well. yes. yeah. and it's not so much that there was the Bible and God breathed into it but God breathed out what would become the Bible and he breathed out through the writers through the people who compiled so it took on parts of their personality and their style, but uh, God's inspiration isn't, it isn't like, you know, we read a poem and think, oh, wow, that's inspired. Yeah. This is completely different yes. because Jesus himself quoted the Old Testament as utterly authoritative when he was tempted in the first three chapters of uh, the Synoptic Gospels. He quoted scripture to Satan as if it was absolute, yeah. uh, which of course it was it to him. And um, uh, th this inspiration isn't just to do with the literary quality, but it is God communicating to us. Yeah. But in saying that, and it isn't a brief of this program to do it, you can't then just go into the Bible and say, right, what's God going to say to me today? Yeah. And then have a read. Yeah. The people came up from Jordan on the 10th day of the first month. Well, That's there we are. Clear. Thank you for that word. But we um, don't do that. You know? No, I, I, I mean... It, it, you, I, I mean, I've been in situations where people have, have almost just given you a, a lucky dip, you know, take, yeah. take, take a scripture for today. Um, <laughs> it is almost like mm. that, isn't it? And tragically, we, we can still use the Bible like that. I mean, uh, just coming back to 2 Timothy 3.16 for a minute, it says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. In other words, the, 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 the Bible has a quality that other books don't have. Mm. But I, I very much always think about that. As you say, that, that word inspired is God breathed. It, almost as if, as you say, God breathed it out. Mm. But those very same scriptures, the Holy Spirit has got to breathe them back into us, as it were today. Uh, that's the picture I like to use. And yeah. so they've, you can't just take any verse and say, that's for me today, mm. is what God brings in. That's right. And, and it wasn't like many parts of the Bible uh, aren't directly for us at all. Most, in fact, most of the Bible is not directly for us. So there must be some kind of a process where we take from Scripture and apply it today. Mm. Um, and that's called hermeneutics. Now, we're not doing that today, Doug, but uh, there is, we, we really do, all of us who are Christians, have to not think of the Bible as a lucky dip or as fortune cookies uh, and, and the, sometimes the daily reading things that we do do not help. No. And th these are sacred stories to inspire us. Uh, these are um, the memoirs of people who've walked with God before we did uh, as well as being the, the sacred sayings of the one that we serve, Jesus, mm -hmm. and the first followers around him. So they're authoritative, they're inspirational, they don't always apply to us. And, and we, can, we don't do the Bible or ourselves any good by either treating it as, I'm now going to read the Bible. What is God going to say to me from this verse? Why don't we just read the Bible to understand the stories as mm -hmm. well? We can, we can be too intense and also we can be too devotional. It's, it is good to read the Bible in a devotional way but we're also to study and to learn and appreciate. Uh, and just because we read a verse, let's say in Ecclesiastes, we can't just apply it directly to our situation all the time. Uh, you could do violence to it, and many people do, you know? Uh, so, but what we are saying, and we're obviously unpack this, mm -hmm. is 
we believe that what we have today that we know as the Old Testament mm. and the New Testament, the 66 books, we do believe that there is an inspiration there. Th- th- this is something above or, 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 or other things. And yeah. therefore, we absolutely believe that. But it, it would be wrong to believe that God, as it were, just dictated it and, and, and brought it out. We need mm. to see that there may be a few minor things that have gone wrong as we, we, we've gone through. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the um, one thing we mentioned in the course of today is that even though we have a lot of Bible manuscripts, wait for us, right? I'll be shot again. There are 400,000 what some people call mistakes. Yes. 400,000. Can we trust the Bible, Doug? We'll, we'll find we're, out today. Uh, we're, um, <laughs> that's just a little teaser. It's a little <laughs> teaser. Yes, we can trust the Keep Bible. Keep we'll watching. understand why uh, <laughs> as, as we go along. Um, in, in one sense, of course, the, the, the book that is the Bible today is, is printed like any other book mm-hmm. and, and it's bound like any other book. And, and therefore, I suppose once, and some people would say, it is just like any other book. But is it just like any other book? I mean, this, many of these manuscripts or many of these writings are very, very ancient in oh, the, thousands of years ago. Yeah. Is it like anything else that's around from that time? Well, there are, there are uh, writings in the Bible which parallel other things. So, for instance, Luke in Acts gives us a, a type of writing which we recognize from the first century outside of the Bible. But what marks Luke out as different is that he is recording the events of the Acts of, not the Apostles really, of the Holy Spirit. And in the Old Testament, as uh, in the first five books, the, the, which are called the books of Moses. Now, Moses didn't write them all, but he compiled them. And we, we, have, we have ancient documents going right the way back to the dawn of civilized humanity, when we could first write and record things. And what marks them out as different is, is the, for us as Christians, is the importance complete importance and authority that Jesus gives them. Mm. And not only did he look back and quote authoritatively from the Old Testament, he said to his disciples, the Holy Spirit who will come will lead you into all truth. And then while, while the New Testament was being written, we had some writers confirming that other writers, so Peter, uh, Peter says in 2 Peter 3, that he, he calls Paul's writings the as they, the people twist them as they do the other scriptures. So Peter is viewing what Paul has written as part of scripture, which is a technical term, uh, meaning you know, the divine me- message of God to us. So while we see the book unfolding through the first century, we, we're beginning to see that people were regarding this New Testament as well as the Old as being completely authoritative and a revelation of God mm. to us. But how, how did what we call today the Old Testament. Mm. I mean, how did those in the New Testament, okay, so in the Gospels, where they quote from mm-hmm. the Old Testament, I mean, Matthew's always saying, you know, so, it, it, so to, to prove that yeah. which is written and to fulfill that which is written. He knew that, so they had those writings. Yeah, and... How uh, did that come about? Mm. Well, what, what happened was, is that uh, some people would be familiar with the scribes and Pharisees from New Testament times. Well, those scribes existed for many, many hundreds of years, and their task was to copy the scriptures. Of course, they couldn't print. There was no printing. So it was painstakingly handwritten. And because of the reverence with which the Hebrew community viewed their writings, we have meticulously preserved these, these manuscripts. They were, in the Old Testament, they were in the form of scrolls. So, you know, you would move back and forth like this, which is quite onerous. Uh, And in the New Testament, there were some scrolls, but uh, it's now widely believed that the Christians invented the Codex, which is that. So that pages were laid on top of each other so you could actually turn to a page Mm. rather than spending your life scrolling back and forth (laughs) like that, which would grip your wrists. But I don't know whether it was good for much else, really. They've got probably repetitive strain syndrome started yeah. and, there. And in fact, we've got a picture of um, 
it's, it's a bit late, it's called the Masoretic Text. So if Luke can put a copy of the Masoretic Text up on the screen, there it is. Now you can see that one's in three columns. Right. Now that's Hebrew, that's what Hebrew looks like. And uh, it's through manuscripts like that that the, the Bible was passed down. So that wasn't a scroll, that, that was actually a manuscript, was it, or was that part of a scroll? Um, I think that's an actual manuscript. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll see bits of scrolls in yeah. some of the other pictures that we've got. But that's, it was writing like that. And if you go to Jerusalem today, you, you can, there's the um, uh, Museum of the Scroll. Mm -hmm. And they've actually got one scroll all around the outside yes. of yeah. the building, inside the building, yeah, yeah. but the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's the scroll of Isaiah, that's right. which is to us is 66 chapters long. Yes. So you can walk from one end of Isaiah to the other <laughs> and not understand a word of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you understand ancient Hebrew, Absolutely. of course. So Absolutely. So, in, in, in other words, God, if you like, not only spoke these words, first of all, or, or inspired, breathed upon people to, 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 to write them down and, and, mm -hmm. and, and to put them down, but he also brought about the means by which it was going to be preserved. Because are any other books preserved like the Bible? I mean, you know, <laughs> did anything else get copied yeah. down like right. this? We, we do, obviously, we do have other ancient scriptures. Um, we also have ancient tablets, you know, uh, clay tablets with markings on them. And, but I think what marks up the Bible, and a bit later on in the program yeah. we look more detail, yes, yes, yeah. is the sheer volume uh, and the accuracy with which the, the Bible has been recorded uh, and the number of manuscripts that we've got. They, they, there are thousands. Yeah. Uh, and it's quite remarkable. really, really is. And there are others. You, you can go and find other, other ancient manuscripts and copies. But a bit later on we will see how completely different the evidence is that we have for the Bible. See, one of the mistakes people make, and this is a big one, I heard it today, actually today, uh, it, I was reading somebody's blog and they'd said this, that the Bible's been translated so many times, it's like Chinese whispers. And uh, the implication is, of course, the, the, in, the original meaning's all been lost yeah. because it's been translated again and again and again. Now. Having considered this matter for some years and studied the issue, I can say with sensitivity to those concerned that that is tripe. <laughs> Sorry, Doug. <laughs> but it is because we, we can shortcut the process. I'll give an example. Sometimes when I'm talking to people, uh, they, will, they will say, how do you know the Bible's you know, reliable? Mm. And I'll say, that's why. Now, what I've got, people can't see that probably. Yeah. But what that is, is a Greek New Testament. And um, it, it just puts in Greek letters, the letters that we've got in the manuscripts with some of the small variations at the bottom of the page. So w our English translations can change as new ones coming out all the time, but we can always, if we have the will and the desire, check the actual original, and it's not hard to do. And of course, whereas some uh, modern what, what are termed as translations are actual paraphrases, and we have to be careful of that because they have added the thoughts of the author. Now, that might be good if you're trying to explain something, but you have to be careful with that. But if you have anybody given a foreign text, there will always be slightly different ways that you can translate those words. So for instance, I mean, I know because I do it often, mm. you go back and you've got a Greek word, okay? And you go back to a good, Greek English dictionary and, and, and concordance and all the rest of it. And you can actually see that that Greek or indeed that mm -hmm. Hebrew word can actually have about four or five different meanings in, in English. Mm -hmm. And therefore, of, sometimes the context constrains mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the, 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 but other times you could actually put any one of those words in there and mm -hmm. it would be right, but you would have two different translations. Yes, you would, but the, um, uh, you know, when, when we're reading English, an English translation, all right, there are those, the most popular one at the moment is the message, which yes. is a paraphrase, Yes. and that has a place, and the person, uh, Peterson has, Eugene Peterson has, has, if you like, tried really hard to make it contemporary, but he's loosed himself from 
been directly linked to the words. The Bible you've got is New, new American Standard, which is very literal. Mm. And, I, and to, to be blunt, it's probably a little bit clunky and it doesn't flow as well. The one I... <laughs> Sorry, the one, but it is literal. Probably goes with me a bit clunky. <laughs> yeah. It is literal, you know. Absolutely. Um, I love it. But I, I use, uh, this is a, a CSB, but I use an NCV, which is a, it translates sentences rather than words. Right. And um, so consequently, its style is More much flowy. simpler. Yes, yeah. not so clunky. Yeah, and That's it's, a it's reading word. age is lower. Yes. Because it's trying to reflect what the New Testament was like. It was a, it was a Daily Mirror yeah, uh, sun type level. But, but what we're saying, of course, is you can go back to the. How do we know it's true? And mm. and you can have these slight variations, but you go back to the original, and you go back and say, well, what was the meaning yep. of that original? Or as far back as we can get, mm. um, we, we we've got as we'll see some quite old manuscripts. Um, so I mean, that's interesting. So you know, you, it, it's not Chinese whispers, and Ooh. you just don't take it on. Because, yes, you've got some modern translations, some of which, as you say, are not really good uh, uh, at all. Others of which have their place, mm -hmm. as long as you realise how they've been brought about and what's the purpose of them uh, from that point of view. But going back, I mean, we're talking about English, and of course most of us can only read the Bible in, in English. Yeah. Um, most people are aware that there are two languages that that the, the Bible comes from. <clears throat> you've got Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New. But you've also got Aramaic in some little bits of, yeah, of, yeah. of the Old Testament. Why were those three languages, were they significant at all that the original mm. manuscripts that we have were written in those sort of languages? Well, this is, this is fascinating, Doug, because... The, most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, yeah. which is a, um, what is broadly called a Semitic language, and it was the language of the people of Canaan. Okay? Uh, Aramaic is also a Semitic language and has a lot of connection with Hebrew, and actually the same as Arabic. So, for instance, people would be aware of Shalom <coughs> in Hebrew, which is similar in Aramaic, but it's Salam in Aramaic. So they're all connected, in Arabic, sorry, they're all connected. But the... the um, Towards, towards the end of the Old Testament period, the, the up-and-coming language, and it was used by the Persian Empire, was Aramaic. So, uh, for instance, I'll give an example. When, when the people, the Jews, came back from Babylon, yep. there's, a, there's an interesting passage in Nehemiah 8 where it says... Which is the, where, the, which the restoration. Yeah. 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 Just, they read the book of the law of God, translating and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was right. Where, where's that? That's Nehemiah 8 verse 8. Right. And the, the, that translating thing is called a targum, and we still have lots of those, where they take bits of Hebrew from the Old Testament and translate them into Aramaic. And um, this shows that the, the language was changing, and it, parts of the Old Testament, not a lot, there's a one word in Genesis, one word in Jeremiah, a chunk of Daniel, two chunks of Daniel, and a chunk of Ezra, um, are in Aramaic and th this is showing the shift mm. because Aramaic now is becoming the language and in New Testament times it's, it's almost certain that the language that Jesus spoke was Aramaic and a lot of, the, a lot of the words that we use or know from the Bible we think are Hebrew like <coughs> Abba, Maranatha or Maranatha, Maranatha yeah. Mammon, Golgotha Gabatha, which is the pavement, all those words are not Hebrew, they're Aramaic. Right. And um, so, so the, this, this uh, shift was reflected at, in the sense that the, 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 the Bible itself began, that God ordained it at the language of change. And when we get into the New Testament period, now there's a sea change again, because this time the message was to go to the Gentiles. Yes. And what did God do? He picked the right time where there were two big empires, the Roman Empire with all the road network and the um, Parthian Empire, which would take the message right the way across to India. And then one language which straddled the Mediterranean right the way across to India. And that language was Koine Greek, Greek. common Greek, yes. which is different to classical Greek, much mm -hmm. more common. Um, and and uh, this was the language of the New Testament. Uh, which all of the New Testament was written in. 
which is a, a massive shift. But it's quite clear that the, mes- it, the, the relevance of the message and the vehicle the message was communicated in was very important to God. So these, when you think that the writers of the New Testament, many of them, not all, but many of them were Jews, their native language would have been Aramaic probably, some might have known Jewish or Hebrew, but they, the, the language of the communication of this message was Greek, mm. which is amazing. And I, I mean, that, that is God, isn't it? Because you, you, you can see the way that... You, know, you, you, you used a very interesting phrase there, you know, God waited for the right time or came at the right time. Yeah. He knew, of course, what, what was going on and, and he knew. Yeah. He, this got the message out yeah. faster, uh, of sure. course. And, and I, I don't know, maybe we could just talk about it now, but we, we have this very interesting, I call it Septuagint, you call right. it something else, don't Sep- you? Well, okay, <laughs> Let, for those who are language geeks, okay, I'm now going to say that th- there is the, the first translation of the Old Testament uh, is called, I call it, the Septuagint, all right? And it's LXX. Now, Luke can put it up on the screen if we can, if we can see it on the, the screen. Yeah. This, this was the translation of the Old Testament into Greek. Right. It was done by Jews in Alexandria in Egypt. And um, what is amazing, first of all, before I say about the, the trans- thing, is that when the, most of the time, when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, we would think they're quoting the Hebrew. Oh, no, they're not. <laughs> they're quoting the Septuagint, the LXX. Can we just underline, and that's why often, when there's a quote in the New Testament, you look back into the Old Testament, slightly it's slightly different. different. And it, it's not because of, uh, of, there's a mistake. No. It is because they are quoting the Septuagint, which you're going to tell me is yeah, wrong in a exactly. minute, um, uh, whereas the, the original is in the Hebrew. And, and that is very interesting. You notice that very the often. The Old Testament original was Hebrew. It was translated yes. into, into Greek in the Septuagint. And for the most part, the New Testament quotes the Septuagint, including Jesus. Mm. So I'm a big believer in pushing the fact that uh, the message must be communicated in a relevant way today. Yes. Uh, rather than, you know, looking, harking back to old ways. But... Pronunciation of Septuagint. The it, Septuagint means seventy, all right. And um, when I learned my bit of Greek, okay, uh, I was told that a g was a g. It's a gamma, and it's a hard. It's not j. It's g. And um, so whenever I pronounce Septuagint, I say Septuagint. The thing is, whenever I hear other people pronouncing it, they say Septuagint. That's right. I was always taught that. Softer and lovely, <laughs> right? And I'm probably technically wrong, but I also think I'm technically right. Because <laughs> a, a gut is a gut. A gut is a gut, and that's <laughs> yeah. my academic Anyway, I say Septuagint, you say sep- yeah. sep- Septuagint, <laughs> and, but I, we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about this Hebrew translation that's into Greek. Into Greek. And, and of course that, again, made those Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, yes. that those scriptures so available, again, to, 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 to the people. They didn't have to have the original language. Mm-hmm. They had it in a language they understood. That's right. And if we look at the... I've got a manuscript picture coming up of Sinaiticus, which was a, a New Testament manuscript from around about the 300s AD. And the, the Sinaiticus was found in monastery in Mount Sinai, and you can see it's quite big. Mm. Now, Constantine uh, authorised 50 copies of the Bible to be copied and distributed. Some people think this might be one of them. But as you can see, it's really quite big. But it was written in a language that almost everybody at that time could I understand. understand. Or it's a, it was a bit like English today. It was everybody's second language. Yes. And all across the Roman world, right the way across to India, Greek was the language that was spoken, not Latin, Greek. Mm. Um, so God, you know, God used uh, the, the language, the available, and it was a much more precise language than Hebrew and Aramaic as well. Mm. And, and I guess, and I, we're, we're, I know we deal maybe a little bit this towards the end of the development of the um, of the English translations, but that also brings us why we do need, and why I think God is 
in modern English translations. So there are good translations, not yes, the, yes. because it is the language of the people. You use this phrase, mm. the Daily Miller la la language, mm. rather than the Times, That's uh, right. be, because diff you know the, the majority of people can understand mm. that, and that that does make su such a difference. God wants us to understand His Word. He doesn't want us to be um, mystified as to what That's it right. really means. And I, I remember, I've, I've known people who will have an adherence to a very old-fashioned type of Bible because it sounds more like God. Mm. Well, no, God doesn't sound like that. <laughs> That's right. People who lived 500 years ago sounded like that. Yes. God is very relevant. Yes. And his, he, through Scripture, He has always chosen the language of the people that, would, that they would understand. Yes. And it's particularly relevant in New Testament times. And it's vital for the Bible because he wants us to understand the Bible. Mm -hmm. You know, I often think of that, you know, they, they think God spoke in King James English or, 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 or whatever, you know, well, you, you, of course, you, you King were. King James wasn't born when God was born. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, to me, God, God's never been in time. God is always been in eternity. He's beginning and end. So he's, he's always up to date. And in fact, he's, he's ahead of us. <laughs> if you really can start <laughs> understanding <laughs> that. But he's always up to date. And, and mm -hmm. it is important that we communicate. Yes, we communicate truth. Mm -hmm. But we communicate it in words that people understand today. That's always what was happening with scripture. That's right. That's right. And I think what... Not only do we have in the manuscripts a picture of a God who communicates in a relevant way, what has been amazing over the last, we could, we could say, 100, 150 years, uh, God has, every, every time there's been a response from people attacking the Bible, it's, it's like as if suddenly he conjures up for us something which is, backs up its authenticity yes. and its reliability and things like that. Can I, can I just show a picture of, of some caves? Please do. Because we're going to look at some caves. <laughs> Qumran. Qumran. Do you know you were asking earlier on about, about um, what marks the Bible that was different? Yeah. And one of the things that marks the Bible that was different is the way that it has been preserved. Yes. So these caves on the screen yeah, at the I moment... I was there last year. It's a brilliant place. Okay, name dropper. <laughs> uh, the, these caves... Um, a shepherd boy was throwing some stones and he heard a cracking sound back in 1947-48 and they discovered big jars mm. full of scrolls and uh, they were hidden there uh, away from the Romans during the late 60s AD uh, and what they found was almost every book of the Old Testament except for Esther on scrolls mm. there were other books there were song books and other writings as well right. but loads and loads of the Old Testament and up till that time, the earliest copy of the Old Testament that we had dated from around 900 to 1000 AD. That was that's a long time after the event. That's right. And part of the reason for that is that the scribes, that, or the Masoretic scribes from the sort of early, just up to that period, they would copy, and then once a, once a manuscript was worn out, they'd throw it away. Yeah. So here was the test. Would the manuscript that we had from nearly a thousand AD, how different would, would it, it be, be? Yes. from the ones that we've just discovered, which were like 200 BC possibly, yeah. okay? Well, they did the test. They examined the Isaiah scroll, which is now on display in Jerusalem, with Isaiah from uh, the manuscript a thousand years after Jesus, and they are almost exactly yeah. The same. It's amazing. It, it, and some people think, oh yeah, so what? But, but that is truly, unbelievably, staggeringly amazing. Because really what you've got to consider is that each one of those letters was meticulously uh, copied out. And yep. each, each, you know, e each... Uh, either page, depending on what they were doing on, uh, they, they had to know it exactly to be right. Mm -hmm. And they would check and double check mm -hmm. before they agreed. And it is amazing that, as you say, with all of those uh, times that that had mm -hmm. been copied, that you can go back mm -hmm. probably something like a thousand years, right. uh, you know, and, and you can have almost the identical thing. That's the amazing thing. Yeah, yeah. And and when it comes to the New Testament, Doug, 
this is where it gets very interesting indeed. Because if I, let me ask a question, and the viewers can all shout, at, we might be able to hear them, if they all shout really loud, we might be able to hear them, okay? If I said, okay, let's take Julius Caesar, yep. okay? Hale and all that yep, sort of yep. stuff. Uh, he wrote a book called Gallic Wars. And it was all about his conquest of Gaul, you know, which is now France, and talks a bit about invading Britain. We've, we've mentioned it before, okay? So if they've seen the programme before, they, they should know. remember the answer. Come okay? on. So how many copies, and, and it was just before Jesus, yeah. 50 years ago. Um, so how many copies of Caesar's Gallic Wars do we have, ancient copies? Right. So have a, little, have a little think about They're all now. shouting out, yes. Is there one? Yeah, there's ten. I can two. hear ten. There are ten. Yes. Ten. You were good. I was good. You gave the number away as <laughs> I've well. I've heard it before. Ten. We have ten <laughs> copies. This is awesome, okay? Now, when it comes to the New Testament, how many copies do we have in Greek of the New... Not anything else, Greek. Yeah. Ancient copies of the New Testament. And I'm going to lean back in my chair. Not and I'm going to say... Five. Thousand. <laughs> It's actually 5,600. Yeah. Now, just to process that, people, that, that Caesar's Gallic Wars, which is a major historical document, I'm into Romans, as you know, and you know, I've, I've read much of Caesar's stuff. Uh, we have 10 ancient copies, New Testament, 5,600. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to put a chart up on the screen, which people can have a look at, and there are so many New Testament manuscripts it goes off the top of the page, mm. off the top of the screen. Look at, there yeah, it is, okay? There it is. And if you look on the left-hand side, you can see Caesar, yeah. Gallic Wars, 10, and a big pinky red line goes straight up the top, yeah. off the top, and hits the roof of the studio. I know. Mm. And I think when you see that, and mm. you see that visually yeah. in such evidence, because you can hear it, but you can also see it, yeah. I think we understand that when people are... Um, coming against the Bible and saying it's not reliable, mm -hmm. it's not. It is nothing to do with uh, with the scientific approach to it. It's nothing to do with with that. It's all to do with religion. It's all to do with what I believe and what I want to believe. Yeah. Because you've got to be able to accept on that basis mm. how how accurate yeah. this book is. But there's 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 even more. Absolutely more, right? That Caesar's Gallic Wars, as an example, the gap between the events yes. and, the, and the earliest manuscript is 900 years. So from the event that took place and the first manuscript we have, 900, 900 years. 900 years, yeah. okay? Now, what I'd like uh, us to do is to put P52 on the screen. P52 is not a social security <laughs> form. <laughs> It's papyrus number 52. Right. And if you go to Manchester in the John Ryland's library, I'm there sure they will let you see it. And there it is, front and back. It's a small, small manuscript. I wear a tie with that on sometimes. <laughs> I might wear it in the next program we do, perhaps. But anyway, that's P52, papyrus 52. And what's significant about that, it dates from around about 120 AD. Now, last century, people questioned John's Gospel, because that's John 18, part of John 18. They questioned John's Gospel and they would say, oh, John's Gospel was written very late in the second century, uh, far too far away from the original uh, events uh, supposedly recorded for it to be regarded as accurate. Wah, wah. Because when they discovered P52, we have, it could be, the copy of the original. So there's the original. Yeah. They make a copy. There's one. And that, that could, be, could it. be it. It's certainly not that far away. No, no, not far away at all. Yeah, and yes. because, because John's Gospel is widely regarded as the latest book of the New Testament, to be last book to be written, um, of course, the earliest piece of the New Testament we have is P52, mm. which I, I, God is so good to us. Yeah. You know, John's Gospel is under a lot of attack, but all those arguments dissipated because we now have a manuscript. But there's even more. <laughs> Should, I, should we say something else? Yeah, no, no, I, I, I'm sitting here aghast and agog. 7Q5. Remember 7Q5. 7Q5. Q is the clue. comes from Qumran. Remember those caves? Yeah, those earlier? caves, yeah. Now, this is 7Q5 is coming up, and it's disputed, 
but there are two manuscripts that are available. One is called the Magdalene Papyrus, and there's this one, which is 7Q5. Now, there's not much of it, as you no. can see, but there are a number of top scholars who believe that that dates from around about 60 AD. Wow. Um, and it's part of Matthew. Yeah. Uh, it's disputed, so that's fair. You know, there's, we need a bit more. If we yes. could find a bit more of it, that would be really good. But on top of that, Beside the one called a Magdalen, the Magdalene Manuscript, there is one which we haven't got a picture of yet, which I found out a few weeks ago. It's likely to be released into the public domain later this year. A book has been written. There's another manuscript uh, fragment, which uh, uh, gospel and part of the Gospel of Mark, and it would date once again, this time certainly, to something like 60. Right. AD, right. which would be amazing. It, it is amazing. In, in other words, what we can clearly say to people is there may be some small um, differences. There may be what are called mistakes. Just okay. variations in the manuscript. Yeah, there are variations in the manuscript. But what we have is so reliable oh, absolutely. that, and, and, and you can take the English that you have and you can go back and you can say, is this a, uh, a clunky translation or a readable translation, whichever one, of the original. And you can know that as, that as the oldest original that, that we have, which obviously is not the original, but no. the oldest we have, you can say it is the same. It is absolutely correct. What we have today mm -hmm. is real. That's right. And there is no manuscript of antiquity, no writing of antiquity, which even comes close mm. to the New Testament and in terms of its attestation. Because we believe Caesar's wars. We, we, believe, what he, we, we believe a lot of these other mm -hmm. manuscripts in historical documents that are fully accepted mm -hmm. in, in that field as being, a re it is only the Bible that has so much more evidence yeah, is. that is disputed. And you can see it, it comes down to spirituality. It comes mm. down to belief. It's got nothing to do mm. with the, the book itself. It's, it's, it's to do with to what with, it says. It's not to do with science because the science says, well, this is a room, this is, there is no book er anywhere from yeah. the past which has so much uh, yeah. reliable information to show that we've got it accurately. Um, the... Uh, you mentioned about the, mis the mistakes, yes. okay? One of the biggest opponents of the Christian faith is a scholar by the name of Bart Ehrman. Now, I have to say, I love reading his books. I was, I was in KFC in New Malden earlier on reading Bart Ehrman. How was that, eh? But anyway, B Bart Ehrman uh, has a go at, at sort of Bible-believing yes. Christians. Okay. And, uh, but anyway, he says he, he's counted them, and we know that's the case. There's probably 400,000 variations in the thousands of manuscripts that we have. Now, if we divide 5,600 into 400,000, it's not that much. No. Okay, it's about 80, I think. Um, so that in, a, in a manuscript, there'd be 80 different errors. This is what he said, that 98% of the variations are worth nothing. Yeah. So, for instance, if you're reading the story of um, uh, uh, the Pool of Bethesda, John 5, in a footnote, in most Bibles, it'll say, some manuscripts say Bethsaida or Bethesda. Yes. It's that type of variation. Yeah, which really is not the issue, and, is it? And the, the, de the demon-possessed man, yes. legion. Yeah, right? okay. It's Gadarene, Gergesene, yeah. there's a few different spells, yeah. that sort of thing. And uh, so 98%, gone. So we have a tiny, tiny amount, 2%, which is left, mm. which... Um, amount to something and they are that sort of nature they, they they're very very small the only significant variations that people would notice would be the end of mark yes because when it was codex form like this we think some of the early manuscripts lost their last page and that's how it worked right. so mark seems to have lost its end and people have inserted another part so i never use that little bit at the end no. to prove things okay. and there's um Another significant piece, the woman caught in adultery yes. in John chapter 7. 7 and 8, yes. Yeah. 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 And we think it's genuine, but it's just in the wrong place. Yes. It's got astray somewhere. You know? But having said that, just so that we can underline mm -hmm. it, if, if we take this 2%, mm -hmm. okay, which, I mean, uh, w what we've got to also understand, it, it is a critic 
that is saying this 2%, yes, yes. but even he only says 2 which is a very small amount mm-hmm. over the thousands of years and hundreds of manuscripts. Mm-hmm. No major doctrine is changed by those 2%. Not at all. It, there could be a few variations. Yeah. Does this bit go here? Does that... You know, and uh, uh, whatever, mm-hmm. but no major doctrine because, okay, w- whether you accept the part at the end of Mark mm-hmm. or not, the essence of what we read yeah. in the end of Mark is in the rest of, of, of the Gospels. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, again, we come back to this fact. We can trust what, 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 what mm. God says. And, and the, you know, since those early Bible times, um, you know, more and more copies have come to light. So, for instance, when, when the King James Version translators, and some people think it was the first English translations, it wasn't. Uh, if, underline that, please, because yes. I think that is important. Yeah, I, people are, live under this myth that somehow the King James Version was the first English Bible. Well, it wasn't. It was quite mm. late. A mm. um, hundred years before, Miles Coverdale. Okay. So if we can have a look at the picture of Miles Coverdale, mm-hmm. Bible translation, that, that was the first printed um, English Bible. Um, so it's a Coverdale. Mm-hmm. Yep, he's found it. There, uh, there it, is. it is. That is the first printed English Bible, mm. uh, preceding the King James Version by nearly a hundred years. Okay? Yes. But anyway, when, when the, the King James Version uh, was, was being translated, they, they used a printed Greek text like this. Mm-hmm. So what, what somebody's done, they've analysed the manuscripts and put it together uh, and the text they used was something called a Textus Receptus which um, was produced by a famous scholar called Erasmus. But what was behind the Textus Receptus was 12 manuscripts. Mm. And when they got to the book of Revelation for instance, they didn't even have Greek manuscripts for the book of Revelation, so they worked off the Latin, which was a translation of the Greek, because that's how few Bible manuscripts we had in 1611. Yeah. Yes. Now, there were, it amazes me that some people talk about the King James Version, you know, go, it's, it's the Bible, all the others are false, and they use they used the King James Version as the measure so that they will compare it with the New International. And because they always quote Tectus Receptus yeah. as the absolute the high point well, it's not. of it. It, it's, it's, a, it's a commercial... It, Texas Receptus was advertising blurb for Erasmus. Um, it's, this is the received text. It was like the sort of thing you would say if you're trying to flog your book, which is what he was doing. <laughs> and it was good, it was good, but the actual Greek was behind the te- Texas Receptus and there were only 12 manuscripts. Mm-hmm. And when, when, you see, when you see these books saying, oh, look, this translation changes the King James Version, you know, in all these places... Well, whoever said that the KJV the, is the basis? That's right. That is the basis. The, the attack, yes, the, the original. The Greek and yes, Hebrew yeah. is the basis. So what has happened since then is that not only have we now got 5,600 Greek manuscripts, we've also got 20-odd thousand, if you include all the quotes in other writings of parts of the Bible. Do you know, if we didn't have any manuscripts of the Bible, yeah. we could create 95% of the New Testament from quotes from outside of it. Amazing, isn't, isn't it? Isn't that staggering? That is staggering. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, um, not only that, but when, when, they tr- when they were translating the King James Version, because they were aware that the Greek that they were reading was different to you know, the classical Greek of Homer and Plato and places, people like that, they thought it was a special divine Holy Spirit Greek that was produced for the Bible. But it was much, much later that they discovered, no, no, it's not. This is, this is Alexander the Great's it's, Greek, yes, Koine Greek. Friendly. Common Greek. Common Greek, real marketplace Greek. Yeah. And because they realized that the, it wasn't as sophisticated as classical Greek, you know, and this just caused them a bit of alarm. But now we, we know and we, can, we have loads, thousands of manuscripts of other writings which illuminate what some of these words mean mm-hmm. uh, that we, we have in the New Testament. So, you know... If people out there are listening to this, if you like the King James Version, you just like it because you like the English. Yes. But please, please don't fall into the mistake of saying, number one, it's more accurate, or number two, uh, uh, it's the way God speaks in these and those, because he doesn't, because that was normal language back then. Yes. It's just old now. 
uh, and that somehow it's the basis on which other translations are made. It's not. And we have a much more accurate method of translating now. I mean, in, in other words, providing we go back to the to, to the original manuscripts, mm -hmm. and, and again, let's underline what we're saying: the original that the oldest manuscripts that we have, and yeah. the best manuscripts we have. That's the basis for translation. That's the basis for what we we need to communicate mm -hmm. today, and and that's what God wants. I mean, because He wants His word to be real to us. And as we, we, we started saying at the beginning, God has breathed this out. Mm -hmm. he, he's taken, and, and as you've shown so clearly uh, tonight, he's taken his word and he's enabled it to come through. He's, he's provided both the language to do it and mm -hmm. the people to do it and the means to do it, yeah. to, 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 to keep his word far more than anything else mm -hmm. in Ever, any other significance yes of course he wants us to have it today mm. of course and we've got to understand that the the attack on God's word mm. is a spiritual attack it's not a scientific attack That's in any right. way absolutely and I think as well there are sometimes we try too hard um, to how can I say this to create other ways of affirming Okay. the Bible. Now one of those, and that, there may be phone calls on this again, is a thing called the Bible Code. Yeah. Now th this, this was developed mainly by, um, I think he was a mathematician, a Hebrew guy, uh, a Jewish guy called uh, Eli Rips, yeah. who wasn't a Christian, um, and a guy, Drosnin, who wrote a book called the Bible, Bible Code. Code. He wasn't a Christian. Either. No. And they, they say, well look, if you put the Old Testament in all these lines and then you you say every 26th letter, yeah, well, yeah. they've all come up with these special codes. Now, that, that, to, for, for, for that to be supported, you have to have a 100%, absolutely, totally complete text with not even one letter Missing. wrong. Yes. We haven't got that. No. And um, that's why I am utterly convinced the Bible code, frankly, is a load of rubbish and we can't rely on it. And it, 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 it doesn't add because that's not the word of God. It detracts. It, yes, mm -hmm. because you begin, you, you start looking for things that, that really aren't there. I, I mean, I've, I've, read, I've read a lot of this myself mm -hmm. and I have to say for me, it doesn't add one thing to my faith. Mm -hmm. um, whereas when the Holy Spirit reveals his word mm. and, 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 and this which some of these words that were breathed out thousands of years ago are breathed mm. into you yeah. and you know the reality. That's what makes the difference. That's what it is. That's, That's what, what makes the difference. Mm. So we can rely, providing we've got a good translation, because mm -hmm. we haven't dealt with all of that tonight, mm. but providing we've got a good translation we can rely on the words in English that we have in that mm -hmm. translation as being what God wanted us to have and spoke to us. Absolutely. And there is only one translation commonly available which is dangerously inaccurate, and that's the New World Translation, mm -hmm. which is produced by Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, all the other commonly available translations, uh, they vary, but for the most part, they are excellent yes, and yes. will do people proud. And again, I think the only other thing I would add to that is let's be careful of paraphrases because let's understand what they do. Because it's rather, I think, rather like preaching. Because, and rather like you read there in Nehemiah earlier on, where, where you take the, and you, you explain the text. Mm. And what a paraphrase does is explain in extra words, yeah. explains what's going on in the text. As long as you understand that, it's helpful. Mm. But, I mean, I remember when the Living Bible first came out, which was really okay. the first yeah. paraphrase of that. I, I heard people starting claiming this and claiming that. And of course it wasn't. It, it, it was an explanation of the Word mm. of God. And I, I think that's the only time we've got to be careful. Let's be aware, paraphrases are helpful mm. to understand difficult passages may be. Mm -hmm. But then they are not direct translations of God's no, Word. And translations fall broadly into three categories. There's um, word-based translations, which are like New American Standard, which are... Uh, ESV, and they tend to be literal, but they tend not to be so readable. 
right? Then there's meaning translations. Uh, the NIV is sort of a mixture of, of those two, but then meaning translations, which are New Century Version, Good News Bible, things like that. And then there's paraphrases. Yeah. The message is the classic modern example of it. Yeah. But we can say that the Bible is reliable. Right. That's how we got our Bible. That's why we can rely on our Bibles today. And that's why we should be studying them, seeking God to minister His Word, to by His Holy Spirit, breathe it out into our lives. JT, thanks very much. Bless you for being with us. See you again next week. In the meantime, read the Word. Let it touch our lives. Bye for now. (laughs) 